Yes, it's a Finnish football show. Hi, I'm Mark Wiltshire from Explore Finland. Finnish football show is back. We've been away for far, far too long. Sorry for everyone that's been waiting. Um, we're, we're here now. I'm joined again, as always, by Mark Hayton from FC Suomi. Hi, Mark. Hello. And to Rich from Escape to Suomi. Hi, Rich. Hello. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. We've been away for three months. Can you believe three whole months that we haven't got together um, to chew the fat? Um, my God, there's been a lot of fat to chew. So we're going we're gonna to get through this, get up to date as uh, quick as we can. Um, I, I have to be away within an hour. So this is going to be kind of a record if we can get finished football show recorded in an hour. Um, I'll explain where I'm heading off to and, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, share a bit of that with the, uh, with the listener um, when the podcast comes out. So if you're listening to the podcast, there will be something extra at the end of the live show. Um, let's start. Firstly, Rich, what shirt are you wearing this week? Um, well, in the, my trip to Finland this summer, I didn't actually buy any football shirts because there were obviously not that many available. So I've decided to wheel out the cupboard, one of these old uh, Footis Forum, Cunningus, Lippmann and T-shirts. So uh, I mean, the last time I went to an away Finland game in Belfast, I was uh, asked by countless people, where did you get it from? So um, if I can dig out the link from the forum, I'll, um, I'll put it on the usual channels in case anyone fancies one. They're only about 12 euros. Okay. The king is represented. Um, the, as always, this episode is live on YouTube. I've just seen the stream start. Um, so if you want to find us on the on YouTube for the live show, um, if you're listening to the podcast this time, then keep your eyes peeled to the Finished Football Show group on Facebook. We normally share on there when the, when the show's going live and, and share a link where you can watch it. Um, podcast hopefully coming out in a couple of days. Um, as I said, we are... we, we um, have a lot of stories to do so we're going to uh, run through a lot of stories quite quickly and I'm going to be fairly strict with you boys about how long how long you can talk about something and then we're going to focus on two key stories in a bit more detail on a positive note what on earth has been going on for Hukuyat in the last three months and on a negative note what on earth has been going on at Asiko in the last few months oh, oh boy um if we've got any live viewers, there's a message box on the side of the screen. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that and see if you've got any questions or comments as we're talking, then please let us have them on there. Podcast listeners use the social media to get in touch with us. So our Twitter handles are Mark is at FC Suomi, Rich is at Escape to Suomi, and mine is at Explore Finland. Uh, and as I said, find the Facebook group. We'll let you join if you, if you ask nicely. Um, okay, Rich, as ever. No noisy biscuits, no f bombs, and we'll break with tradition and, uh, and run through as many stories as possible. No news, no news section this week. We're just going to go through as much of what's been going on over the last few months as possible. So um, I thought maybe we'll start with <laughs> Rich. Is such an idiot. He's got an obscene mug that he just held up to the camera. So um, I'll try. <laughs> I'll see if that. I can find that for the uh, for the image. <laughs> for the featured image for the show. What you get? Uh, going... No F-bombs, bang, visual. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's going so smoothly, and now you've made me laugh live on air. This this show isn't about laughing. We're going to be talking about ASCII court season. That's not a laughing matter. Um, how about then we start with uh, vacation? Um, I guess first things first, It's pretty, the season's pretty much over, isn't it, Mark? Well, I mean... It looks like I, I want to thank Yee Co for turning up. Um, they've they've been giving us some nice entertaining crowds, but but um, very little in the way of kind of competition at the bottom. So I think Yee Co are going to take that bottom spot. Uh, um, Yee Co from two weeks ago might disagree with you. <laughs> I think well, I, I think so. I think even even with all of the kind of cat catastrophes lurking in the future for Yee Co, I still think if you put all those together, they couldn't drop to. I think I think Yee Co are in about fifteen points, about something like that at the minute. They're, I mean, they're gone. I mean, Hifki are, are really, really trying to give them a run for their money. They are that they're really, they're really poor this season, but they're still not getting really anywhere near. So, just for those listening, we've got Yee Core in twelfth at the bottom with fifteen points, and then Hifki in eleventh with twenty-one points, and at tenth is Kemi with thirty points. So you're right. There's a there's a real gap. 
opening between those bottom two and, yeah. the, and the rest of the pack. Yeah. So and and yeah. So Hifki, like I said, are trying because they're really poor, but but Yiko are um, uh, just just not getting a foothold in games. And then at the other end of the table, um, yeah, Hoyiko are living partly on the fumes of of Morelos's you know brilliant open open to the season before his transfer, um, and then they they seem to be clawing out wins now with a probably the meanest defence. Uh, I don't know how it would have put up in the previous years, but certainly Patron and Yasto at the back are, are just kind of shutting out games for 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 Hoyiko. They've, and, been, they've only conceded ten goals in twenty five games. That's you know, the fact they've scored 57 as well, I mean, it's, it's ludicrous compared to the rest of the league. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, th I think they're only, what is it, is it six points or seven points or something like that clear at the top? So it's not like um, a It's four, 14. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I mean, uh, it's, it's quite strange because I've seen a couple of Hoyuko games recently and they don't look amazing, but they do control games start to finish. Um, and it's a bit. I don't know. It's 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 it's. It, I suppose we. I suppose we were too. We got too good in the last couple of seasons with Asiko winning the title and then the Marienham winning the title. And I think both those went to the last day. So it was. There's, there's been too much excitement in the last couple of years in the Vegas League. <laughs> <laughs> and at the, start, at the start of the season, I think we all thought this was um, that, that it was. It was probably going to be Hoyiko that had a, a really good chance of taking this, um, and. But you had a you had a a, a prediction about coops. Um, yeah, I mean, coops. The last sort of four or five years have been very, you know, the the epitome of mediocrity. They've sort of won games here, but generally haven't impressed anyone. They've had a couple of players coming through, but they've moved on. Um, this year, they got Yanni Honkavada in, who was a Hifki manager last, well, for part of last season, and was the manager who brought them up, and. Um, they, they really sort of went a different way around recruiting. Um, what they had done in recent years was, you know, they were very much one of these clubs at the whims of an agent who would sign players from Africa and, and bring them in as a, a sort of shop window for Europe. But, uh, you know, they, they brought that's, in... That's Freddie Adu. Well, <laughs> so he, uh, he lit up the league when he was there, was that three years ago? But, um, but no, this year they, they've sort of brought a lot more experience. They brought in uh, Saucer from Hoiko, Saxman mm -hmm. from Rops. They brought Vertinen back from Scotland, um, the young goalkeeper. And um, yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're third at the moment. They've already scored as many goals this year as they did last season. Um, you know, they just look so much more consistent. And I mean, they're never going to win the league, let's be honest. But, you know, even the, the striker they bought, the Salami, who's had these issues and his various bans for assaulting the referee and so on. But uh, no, I mean, they, they've looked really, really impressive. And, you know, certainly compared to, you know, they were the team who had a really good run in Finland, uh, in the Europa League in 2012. They got through to the playoff round. But um, mm. since then, they've done absolutely nothing. But it's nice to see them back. And obviously, they're sort of my team. So, uh, you know, by, by marriage. But, uh, yeah, no, it's good to see them doing well. I think I think back when we spoke last time, we were talking about uh, Morelos at uh, Hoyiko, who's since since moved to uh, Rangers in Scotland. Um, but he's currently, although he hasn't been here for three months, he's uh, currently still fourth, actually joint joint second in the goal scoring <laughs> for the Vakehouse Liga. So it sh it shows where he would have been if he'd still been um, still been here, perhaps. Um, but it's got a lot tighter up there, and there's somebody else at the top of the of the goal scoring charts now, and uh, and maybe we'll head away with it, which is Alexi Gangeskolka, uh, uh, Mariaham. What have you seen yeah, of him? Mark? Yeah, he's, I, I I love I love Alexi. He was uh, he was one of those ones who was you know uh, destined for great things. He moved out to Holland, I think, when he was about twenty, but then he had a I think a couple of repetitive cruciate injuries, um, and so he came back. That was the, back in the last season to Mariaham, and he didn't. Do like I don't think he got a lot of games initially when he came back, but this this season he started. He's played regularly up front for Mariaham, and I just like him. He's just one of those um, uncomplicated, big, strong forward guys who scores goals. So it's um, I was I was expecting this year that uh, Timo Furuholm would come back at Inter and smash up the league because he like he also had injury problems, but he did well in Germany, uh, and it's not kind of sort of falling for him. And the sort of thing that I was going to expect. From Borussia is exactly the kind of um, performances and, and, and 
uh, play that, that Kangaskalk has delivered. Although he's been in the press recently about saying that some of the some of the opponents that he's got in the Vegas League are, are pretty low quality. So uh, it's a bit, it's a bit. So he's he's doing well and he's scoring goals, but I, it, it, there's also this there's a part of him that I think he's not maybe testing himself as much as he can, which is sort of a bit of a strange thing. And what I was saying about Morelos is interesting. If you look at the at the top of the goal scoring charts, there's well half of the Hoi core squad seem to be in the top in the top, <laughs> in the top eight. Uh, you, you've got Axelie Pelvas from uh, with eleven goals. You've got Morelos, as I said, are still on 11. You've got Filip Valencic on 11. Uh, and then in eighth place, uh, you've got Evans Mensa with eight. So they're uh, interesting to see Pelvas on 11. And Tuco for Ilbez also on 11. That's what 22 man. goals, ex Asikor goals, just sitting there in the, in the <laughs> top 10. And you've got Billy Irons at number, number 10. He scored seven, but that's in a, in a struggling team. And he's been a bit sort of out of the squad during the sort of summer months as well. Yeah. Who would let Tuko go on a free? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> well, it, but then, he, but... Didn't, he didn't score the goals here, did he? You know, okay, so so he, he was another one that kind of flattered to deceive a little bit. And I, I, I think, I, I do cut some of the players some slack this season to a degree, because actually, cool. there's been a lot of ins and outs and that's unsettled the team. And we'll, we'll come on to this a little bit later. Um, but the same with, um, with, uh, in Boma, Totti, um, he he looks really strong and powerful, and he can do really good things. And then comes to the games and doesn't really doesn't really do it. And I think Tuko was the same. I, I don't know what. Maybe he's just found a manager that can get the get the best out of him now that he's at, at Ilves. Um, but it's frustrating to see all those former players banging in goals left, right, and centre for other other teams. That's for sure. Um, well, just, uh, well, last week, Raheem is goal. Oh, that's lovely. Again. Again. Uh, wow. Yeah, well, and that's someone who <laughs> could really get into the Ashley Core starting team when he yeah. was here. Um, but I don't know how many he's. Uh, yeah, he's only scored three, but still, um, quality. Not what quantity. about what about? Sorry, Rich. Well, no, no, it was quality, not quantity. Of that last goal, it was uh, well okay. the one he scored in midweek. It was cracking. And what about uh, changing subject? I'll, and I can stop talking for a moment or two again. Um, what about happenings down at FC Inter? Blimey, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> well, take us back three months where we were where we were uh, before the summer, Rich. Was everything looking quite settled at that moment? Um, not settled. I think um, we were looking optimistic in that, you know, it was the first time really Chef Gikuchi had had a full sort of winter... In, in charge of a club that was relatively settled, had a bit of money. Um, but again, it just seems to be, obviously he left and there were various rumours coming out that, um, did he jump? Was he pushed? Um, you know, there were some issues about signings and money again and, and everything else. And, and he, he left at the start of August, so sort of five, six weeks ago. Um, but one of the stats that sort of emerged just before he left was that, in some like eighty odd Vakehaus Liga games as manager, he'd never won two in a row. Mm. Um, now, albeit he was in charge of teams in, in Honka and Vanta, who were sort of at the bottom of the table, but um, and even at Inter, he didn't manage it. But Inter were after Hoyko, the, the second top scorers in the division. So it just seemed to be that you know, nothing was running, you know, as well as perhaps he'd have liked, especially with the quality of forwards he had. You know, his brother, Timo Furuholm, he's got Ben Kalman, who's coming through this season mm. and really looking promising. But um, no matter what it is, there just always seems to be some sort of turmoil or drama behind the scenes, which, you know, is a shame because, you know, this this was set up for a good run and, and for whatever reason, it's not happened. It's a bit, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know all of the ins and outs, but I think there must be something in the way that they... They bring players in and they finance them because it, like, you can see from a footballing perspective when you look at Chef, whenever you look at Sheffield's teams, they always pretty much score goals and they're always relatively combative. Um, but they're, but I don't think he's ever had a team that's been able to kind of like keep clean sheets, basically that's been able to just sort of, you know, lock out games. You know, there's lots and lots of examples of Sheffy when he's when he, they've been three one up or, or four four two up or something like that, and they just haven't closed out the last ten minutes, and they've sort of invited a 
a cup final finish. But it's but still, I mean, when I when I look at Shevki, he just okay. He kept Honka up when uh, when they had no right to stay up because they weren't playing players and there there, there was an exodus of, of talent. Uh, he got PK thirty five up when they had no right being promoted because they were they returned very quickly to where they came from. Um, he hadn't taken PK thirty five down when they when they when they kicked him out, so he's never still technically been relegated. He did keep Inter up last year, which wasn't like a foregone conclusion. So his CV is not exactly, you know, it's not exactly bad. When you when you look at the sort of the results on the pitch and what he does, he just has a real tendency to bring in talented, experienced players at, at what must be a relatively heavy cost. I think once they signed Oyala uh, in the summer, Miko Oyala, for, who, who'd left VFR Allen. And uh, you look at it and then you start adding up, okay, well, how many players have you got on your books in India that have been like on decent pro contracts in, in big big leagues and big clubs? And there's like, you know, uh, Oyala, Furo, Mac Kanji came back. Uh, he's got his brother, Niaji, who's going to be doing, doing decent money-wise. He still had Garcia, who he always takes, and, and then Julian Faber that he brought in. And you think those are the kind of players who aren't going to come to the Inter for, you know, like standard Vegas League of contracts. So while they're probably not sort of throwing transfer money around, they are probably throwing contract and wage money around a little bit. But it's um, a bit... We've got a question, a comment here, Mark, from on the message board here. Yusbe15 says, it's hard, it's hard for, for Inter to get any goals when they don't have any idea in their, in their attacks, in their forward play. Is that something that should have been you know, dealt with, with all that money being spent? He likes direct play. He likes big guys and he, likes, he believes in sort of experienced players. So... Faubert and, and Garcia were brought in for that, to be the kind of creative links. But, I mean, I do take the point. There always does seem to be this lack of kind of practical execution. When people, when players under Shevki get stuck, they, they, his only real answer is work harder <laughs> and fight more. And I, I think yeah, that's part of part of who he is. So I, I take the point. It, it, it's not, he doesn't create beautiful football on sides. How about if we if we move on from Bakehouse Liga? I, t I did tell you we're going to rip through these as, as much as we possibly can. Um, let's have a little look at a, a couple of things Palo Lito related. Um, we'll come on to an update on all the different versions of Swarman Cup that are currently running. Um, Rich, that was a noisy biscuit. It was a noisy? But yes. Definitely. Definitely? It was definitely a biscuit. <laughs> um, Mark, uh, maybe, uh, or, or Rich, whoever, whoever wants to say a little bit about Perotti Ayala, the uh, for chairman, former chairman of the Finnish FA, the Palo Lito. Well, that well, okay with that. Yeah, so I mean, it, you know, it's obviously sad um, uh, to, to, to lose somebody and nobody kind of uh, deserves it. Uh, he, uh, he went through a lot of, um, I think, uh, uh, he needed to take time off work and then came back and was sort of adamant and resolute that he could do it but I think was probably fully aware that um, that uh, it wasn't going to be a <laughs> that he tried I think he tried to throw himself back into his work after after taking his, uh, his sick leave so it was and I thought uh, so what's the best thing to say I think the best thing to say is that uh, he was doing he, he's been Widely, there's been lots of comments, lots of people um, passing on their condolences. That's been really good. It's kind of shown how well connected Bertie was, not just at home, obviously as you would expect for a chairman, but how well connected he was in places like FIFA and UEFA and all, all around the world. So he got a lot of um, good notes from there. And I think just before uh, he passed away, he'd started to write a blog in which he was trying to talk about the issues that were facing the Palito and the kind of his belief about how he thought he could take it forward. And I think in that sort of channel to the fans, there was still, there was one or two areas where, where most people can kind of agree. You might disagree about how he organizes people and funding to, to lead different projects, but you can agree that I think you've probably seen that the, the structure, particularly of the kind of theory to the regional period, was one of the biggest inhibiting factors to, to developing football in Finland. So he was what trying to one, What about one lasting sort of legacy, one positive thing that he, that he will be remembered for? Okay, his, uh, he started the, the identity project, which we, we don't know a great deal about. His, his last big program was this Kaiki Bella thing, and we always kind of said it's a, it's a difficult thing to um, to say that from football is doing well when when player registrations are up because the national team is still in the, in the toilet and 
Vegas Liga teams can't make it in uh, in Europe, for example. But the fact is, if, if you kind of had that logic and you believe that more registered players lead to uh, you know greater participation, better understanding, and like better engagement with football in Finland, then his program of Kaiki Pella worked, and so he was able to kind of really. Inc- I think I can't remember what the, what the numbers were, but it was something like fifty to twenty percent more uh, registered footballers across Finland in the last three or four years. And, and grassroots is something that uh, a football association should be trying to develop as well. So um, yeah. let's let's leave it there. I think it was important that we should sort of mark the passing of of Berti Ayala. And um, now, Rich, perhaps you'd like to talk about the Suomen Cups, plural, yes. they're currently live, um, which is maybe one of Palo Lito's uh, less impressive uh, yeah. or organisations. I mean, we're at the, well, in the 2016-17 tournament, uh, we're a fortnight away from the final, finally. Um, that's Asiko against Hoiko. Um, the semi-finals for that, I think, were played at, I think, the 1st of April. So um, they've had a bit of time to, you know, to prepare for this. And um, they've had a few dress rehearsal matches and they haven't gone particularly well. I think the yeah, can, can, you, can you believe it? I'm not exactly... Yeah excited for this game coming yes. up there's a cup final on my own doorstep and in the previous two games i think we're 12 nil down on aggregate yeah um so that's kind of just one of these things that they've it's just been hanging over for, for quite some time um also on the same day it's the regions cup final which has as calls academy team uh playing in that so that should be quite interesting you know it's nice that having one stadium hosting both of their sort of well, I say senior, but representative teams are, are featured, which is you know good in in some way, and it's nice that the academy team has been doing so well in is it Coleman and Division. Um, I think they're looking like they might get promoted, but um, this year or next year's or whichever year's tournament, uh, we're into the third round now. Um, there's a couple of games have already taken place. This is the penultimate round before the group stage. So uh, yeah, we've got. Excuse me. Is Lumi going to join us? Yeah. Lumi's making a regular appearance in the uh, Finnish football show. Yeah. But um, yeah, so the next round, the fourth round, that's where the winners of each game go to the group stage. And um, yeah, it's just a saga, isn't it? It's, um... I, I, I was looking at the website uh, last night and could, could see uh, all, all the different rounds up to the fifth round. And it was all a bit confusing, but there's, there's basically now... Um, like, let me let me find this. Oh, have I got it open? No, I haven't got it open. Um, but there's basically now eight, uh, four, four, eight, four fixtures, eight teams to play, and then those go into the group stages with fake house league teams. Is that how it works? Um, pretty much, yeah. So there's there's five. There'll be five teams from this knockout round or the next round, and yeah. then they join tw- twenty five teams. Um, but it's I'm not sure. I think it's only some of the teams. I think, was it Tampa United decided not to join? Mm. Um, Olin Palasura, I don't think, are in it either. Mm. So um, it's, again, we're, we're down to less than 100 teams have entered the tournament, where it was nearly 400 10 years ago. Mm. It's, um, you know, I don't know where the final's been played next year, but it's it's very much the same. But uh, absolute lack of interest on all parts, including mine. That's that's not a very good attitude. Not very good attitude from a co-host of the Finnish football show. They, they don't pay me to advertise. <laughs> well, how about we we move on from that then to um, this under 19s tournament that's taken place in Pokemon. So there were um, games between Portugal, Belgium, Finland, and Holland taking place in Vaza and in Sainioki, what kind of a warm-up for next summer's uh, under-19 Euro competition. Um, I asked you one of you, well, I asked you both of you guys last night, what was the score in the final game between Finland and Holland? Because it's still not on the uh, Palo Lito website. Um, but it didn't go very well for Finland, Mark. No, I don't know, sure. I'm not sure they'll ever put it up. Uh, what, was, it was, what was the score in the Holland game? Nine... Nine nil, nine nil, nine nil. That's how it ended. Um, uh, it's, oof, it depends what you want. I mean, so on the pitch, uh, there's pretty much nothing you could talk. It, it's it's like uh, it was you know 
just sort of real schoolboy stuff, and that's hard to say because uh, they are schoolboys because they are yeah, because they are in such a young age. But like when you think about sort of like Finnish football and development and stuff, so after the game, so they, they did they did the usual stuff, and they interviewed Sergei, uh, right? And you could just I mean you see his face. So he talked he talked about the you know the the three games for them all. He talked about specifically the Holland game and, and how they got basically outrun and out outfought and all the rest of it. But you could see sort of like, I think the last question that the guy had was either incredibly naive or incredibly poignant. I can't decide which was like, okay, where do we go next? And okay, I remember this, this teenager who's just had his backside handed to him by the Dutch just sort of stared blankly at the camera. And you could, you sort of started to well up and you thought, this is a bit like, this is trauma. Like, this is the kind of thing that could break a kid's career, like, you know, for, you know, forever. So it's really like, I mean, I don't want to get too melodramatic about it, but I mean, three games, one goal, <coughs> fourteen in, fourteen conceded, and uh, just an absolute demoralization. It's a bit for a young team. That's that's really heavy and hard stuff. Mm. So we're looking forward to the competition next summer, then. Well, this is <laughs> well, this is it. I mean, off the pitch, you know, by all accounts, it all went really well. You know, the whole. In the way that, yeah. say, the Confederations Cup is the, the lead up to the World Cup, and in terms of testing the venues and the infrastructure and everything like that, you know, and you've got two new stadiums, and you know, there, there was a fair bit of local interest. I mean, the tickets were fairly well priced, and you know, kids were allowed in for next to nothing. Um, you know, and it, and it was great. It's just, um, you know, you've wheeled out. You know, Portugal, who've won pretty much every tournament at age group football they've entered in the last 18 months. Um, you've got Belgium and, and Netherlands. So, you know, you want prestige premium teams to come and play. But it's, um, you know, you, you do wonder at the end of it, you know, what sort of impact will that have on the players? And mm -hmm. the fact is, like Mark said, you know, they, they've wheeled out Sergei Romenko to do this sort of interview at the end of the game didn't hear anything from the manager until the day after and even then it was just a couple of sort of renter quote types you know didn't actually okay. you know the manager should be shielding those players from this sort of thing he should be stepping up you know he's probably paid a reasonable salary to to take that on the chin mm. but he's a finished coach and, um, as well isn't it to stick a microphone in front of a player at half time and immediately after the game and you know in the hockey you see them going around the the the, the dressing room you know before, during, and after, with a with a camera and a mic. So, um, but yeah, on the end of a shellacking, as somebody described it last night, um, mm. maybe not the best thing to do. Get them, get them out of the firing line, literally. No, and and I mean that that's pretty much going to be the bulk of the squad who play in the tournament next year. So, you know, you've got it's mostly those players who are going to be featuring. You know, th these are players who, you know, some of them are either at big, big clubs in Europe or, you know, you look at Ademi, he's playing week in, week out for Kemi now, you know, scoring goals, you know, he's getting a lot of top level Bakehouse League experience and yet, you know, they go away with the national team and get absolutely fun. Mm. So um, hopefully, you know, the, the preparation for the tournament, that, I'm sure that wasn't on the agenda, but, uh, you know, hopefully it's not going to cause too much long term damage. I, I also think I also think it's not insignificant that you can't find the match report on the on the <laughs> website. I because I, I genuinely think there's an, an absolute aversion to trying to figure out how to deal with this kind of thing. And I think, so, I mean, it's it's not easy to write to write anything after you know like an absolute pasting. But you can't pretend it didn't exist. And I think there's a big there's a, in in large parts of the of the Balalito and in the football, there's a lot of that sort of hidden format. Well, it's bad news. No one's going to want to read it, so we just don't talk about it. And you think, well, all that leaves is the interviews with the players. Mm. And like, like, like Rich said, you know, part of part of the guy's paycheck, who's in charge, should be to, to shield those players. And I mean, his job really is to develop. And this is the kind of trauma that could really, really stunt players. So, or just disaffect them. You know, what I mean? like they don't want to. Like the Arenkos have a have a particular engagement problem with the Finnish national team from the setup because. And they're talented, skillful guys, and they think that they know better. So, if there's no structure to offer them when it's going bad for them, then there's no value in the ballot either to those guys. And you think, well, this is perfectly the time when you when you can turn around when he's thirty and say, "Look, I was there for you then when you needed me." 
but we can't say that now. And that, that, that under-19 Euros competition takes place in uh, June, July. So let's uh, maybe let's just keep an eye on other under-19 results between now and then, and just just refer back to it as we as we go through the uh, through the rest of the year and into next year, um, and see what sort of impact it's it's having. We don't want we're, we're not criticising the kids. We don't want them to feel that that you know we're negative about what they did. Um, let's let's get behind them and uh, and support them into next year. I think so. One thing as well that you have to say: is that if you lose like three or four nil, you can you can say that's on the players. Any team that loses nine nil, that's not on the players. That's a coach. I mean, you know, there's lots of different like you know variations. But, but if you were if you lose nine nil, you can fundamentally not understand the, the deficiencies in your side and the strengths of the opposition. And there might not be a good way to defend against the Dutch, but it's definitely a coach's job to protect against that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Let's leave that one there. Um, next thing on our on our agenda is summer transfers. What's been going on? Who's who's moved where of interest this summer? Well, I guess the I mean the, the big sort of one was was Morelos leaving Hoyko. Um He's got the Rangers in Scotland and has scored seven goals in five games. He was the player of the month for August. Um, they got about I think it was just under a million pounds. Rangers paid, so that's um, you know hefty whack in Hoyko's coffers. Um, they replaced him with Philip Valencic from Kemi, uh, and his release clause was thirty thousand euros. So, you know they've they're not like for like. You know that you know Valencic isn't a, an out and out forward in the way that Morelos was, but you know he's already come in and scored, you know some goals, um, and certainly for for thirty grand, you know he's a competent competent player. Yeah. Um, Hoykov also signed another fellow whose name was Jean Bagugi who's an Ivorian centre-forward who had come from Russia. And I remember watching his first match, and I can't remember who it was against, and he started for 45 minutes. He was hooked at half-time, and it reminded me of watching George Weyer's cousin playing for Southampton. He was, Ali Dyer? Yes, former, <laughs> fin, former Finn Parfoot player he was. But, um, yeah, he was just dreadful. Um, he's already left. They've packed him off to Turkey. So um, yeah, one, one for the uh, one for the archives there, but um, yeah, no, I mean that was that was the the big story really. I mean it was the usual sort of players you've never heard of coming in, and there the aren't you don't tend to get a lot of transfers between Vakehouse League clubs sort of during the win during the season. But uh, yeah, I mean that was that was the big one. Any others caught your eye, Mark? Yeah, and abroad. So so Sally Weisen and left Aiko uh, to and he's joined Spal. So we've got another Serie A defender. His first game was a nil-nil draw clean sheet against I think, Lazio. His second game yeah. was a win against Udinese. So he's taken to life in uh, Serie A very well because they're not like they're a team. I think they were odds on roughly to, to go back down. Um, so so he started well and he's looking, you know, more confident. I think uh, you know if he gets a season, I mean not even a season. If he gets half a season under his belt, roughly he'll be like. He'll, he'll become the pro that we all kind of expect him to be. So uh, I think that's a, an incredible move. The other guy moving out of Stockholm was Eero Markinen, who's gone to the, the club that has destroyed more hope in career than Dynamo Dresden. I so so uh, in, in Dresden, Markinen's played, I think, about 30 minutes or so, um, one or two sub appearances, um, and he's not notched yet. So. He's getting Markland's getting to that age now where he needs a he needs thirty games and he needs to get at least ten goals out of them somewhere so he can start again. Because, uh, I would have, we hoped that, that the move back to Aiko was the one sort him out and he's played off and on but he's never managed to stamp down a regular place there in Sweden. So I hope I hope he can turn it around in, in Dresden but for some reason we send a lot of players there that don't get any time. There's also been a couple, a couple of batches of new players coming to Asicor, which I think is probably going through one by one is, is a bit is a bit futile because some of those that came in during the season have, have moved on already, and others that have come in haven't played many many games. Um, so let's let's not make too many judgments there. Other than, and again, I'll talk about it in more detail, but just this, you know, batches of new players dropping into a into a squad. 
and trying and a diff, for a different manager and trying to assimilate those different into this squad, I think is probably part of what's what's been going on here in in Sanyoki this year. Um, do you want me to talk about that now? We've got two more things to talk about in a bit more detail. We've got about um, half an hour. One is, it, I think that's your call would be good. It's we're we're there now, aren't we? We might as well stay. Yeah, yeah. go on then. I'll, I'll I'll do it. It's been an utter utter shambles of a season. Well, we did. So we did say, like, so you mentioned that just before, just then, like about dropping lots and lots of new players in. But yeah. we said two, three shows ago that the the, uh, the work as needs to be fundamental. Like the whole spine needs to be actually addressed. And I think that was, I mean, we thought a while ago that that was the sort of part, the reason behind the partner of, of the ways. But it seems even on the pitch that you've not really brought anybody in to try and address it. Well, I was I was talking about this at home this morning. So this this season, my girlfriend Satu, she's got her season ticket. She's there every game. Football's something that she's had a passing interest in before but she's never gone regularly to watch the games so she started coming last season when things were okay and then at the end of the season a bit better and then we started this season with losing a load of the of the influential players that were there last year like risky like duco like um oh and, and names uh, um you and Oyala went to uh, Oyala when um oh, course, course, Martin, you know, went to yeah um and they they kind of weren't weren't replaced well it, they weren't completely replaced by the time the um Simo had left which was pretty much as the season was starting they were playing so so then Bostrom starts signs some more players to fill gaps but basically, that was at the start of the season. All the pre-season, all the Storm and Cup games didn't feature those players. Um, you could see that the team hadn't gelled. And I, and I was just saying, come on, let's be, let's be patient. Let's let them find the way the manager wants them to play. Let the team gel. And it didn't work, obviously, because Bostrom was then moved on. Um, in came Manuel Rocker, who as I understand, was on his way to the club anyway as a coach. And then by the time he actually <laughs> arrives in Saniyoki, finds that he's, he's going to be the first team manager, first team coach, whatever. He's the, he's, the head, he's the head guy. And tried to work at coaching the players that were there. So you've got the players left over from the previous season, plus those that have been brought in by Simo during the close season, plus those that have come in under Bostrom. What's with those for... I don't know, a couple of months. Then another batch of players comes in in June, July time. Maybe, yeah, maybe July. And some of those that came in under Bostrom, for example, um, Facundo um, left. Now he was one that got the fans excited. He was a bit kind of in and out of the game, but he had some creativity and he left which was disappointing. We had a great song for him as well, which, which got everyone quite excited. Um, and we can't sing that anymore. Um, the, and those new players came in, they haven't all played. Yoel Mero, uh, young um, Finnish defender centre-back, and Sundman, young Finnish left-back, have actually come in and looked quite strong really good going down the going down the wing and he had a few years at Aston Villa and uh, at the academy and, and it's come back and looks a good a good player but there's I, I feel like there's all these kind of batches of players and and dare I say cliques of players I don't know mm. um, that just aren't playing together and you know the I, I've been saying all season we've been starting games well it's, it's clearly a confidence thing, you know. Someone for, for me, someone who's been watching football for thirty-five years or whatever, you know, when a team is unconfident, it's not that they're not trying. It's not that they're being lazy. They just don't have the belief that what they what they're going to do is going to work, and therefore, things they they stop trying things. They stop moving into space because they're not sure that the ball's going to come there, and then, and then the whole thing starts to break down and. I think I didn't see the the, the six nil away to 
But my God, I saw and I felt the 6 0 at home <laughs> to Hoyiko. And, and in the first half, we, it was good. It was, it was pretty even. We made chances, they made chances. One, one big difference all season is that when Asiko gets a chance, we don't take it. We, we scuff it wide, we put it over, we, we take maybe one touch too many in the box. And I, I, that's probably as well. And if you saw the goals against Hoyiko, um, they probably had seven shots and scored six. And they were flying in from all over the place. And they weren't, okay, it wasn't Axelou's best game, but in goal for, for Asiko. But you wouldn't blame him for all six goals. One or two he could have done better with. Others, you're talking top corner, bottom corner, just inside the post. It's not and unlucky because what happened is in the second half, the second goal went in on, I don't know, 55 minutes or something. And then you just saw heads drop. And every time they attacked, they came through on goal and it was painful. I think it was 4-0 after 66 minutes. And I was like this head you know resting on the on the on the 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 fence in front of my where i was standing like that and everyone else was as well and it was i i think i think by the end of it the clock it was singing we want seven six is not enough if my translation is is correct and i couldn't even bring myself to join in with the gallows humor i was beyond i was beyond the gallows and cool and, and, and actually to be you know that that there had been a run of five or six games unbeaten through the summer, which is why somehow Asikor is sitting there on, was it, 35, 35 points. It's, it's amazing to me that we've managed to win 10 games. It, it's won 10, drawn five, lost 10. That's a lot of games to lose. And I think the wins have come with sort of 1-0, 2-1 victories. And the defeats have come in 6-0, 6-0, 4-0 hammerings so that's probably why it feels like it's been a really a really tough season um and against yi Corps, it was the same thing that like first half individually the ashley core players are better than yi Corps. you know clearly you can see it in the way we were playing first half started take um and then in the second half there were these two um two minutes uh, not sorry not two minutes two spells in which Yi course scored twice you know they they got two goals in i think six minutes and then 10 minutes later they got another two goals in six minutes and the whole team folded again and that's the team that was bottom you know we said we said before they, they're sitting there on 15 points and they got three of them against us in a four nil victory and that that was the first time I've ever heard Cloppet boo its own players. And it's not because they lost, it's because the manner in which they lost and the fact that that has happened too many times this year. Um, and looking, like looking at, the, at the squad, I said that all these batches of players have come in. And if you look through the squad, there are a lot of players that are young Finnish players. You know, Sundman and Obed Malalo um, and Danny Hataka playing for the under 21s and Hataka was called up to the um, national team, the, the, the full team, the full squad uh, to, to, as a reserve earlier this week or last week. Um, and you've got players like Larkson and, and Hetemai and, uh, and even someone like Billy Irons who's been in Finland for six or five or six years and it is a, a kind of a product of the Finnish league. I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's about, I don't want to sit here and criticise foreign players coming in because that's, I'm a foreign player coming into the Finnish system as well. And I, you know, <laughs> I'm not negative about that, but maybe, but maybe there is a core of, a, a, a squad can be built around these young Finnish players that would connect with the fans uh, that, that maybe can be the, the foundations for rebuilding for next year. I don't, I don't know, but it's, um, something's got to happen. And, and I, I said at the start of the show that I'm, I'm heading off uh, as soon as we finish recording here. There's a, a fans forum at 
on my Asphir Stadion here in Sainioki. Um, for all, all fans, uh, it's going to be uh, Raimo Sariavi, chairman of ASICO, Temo Vertela, the uh, um, managing director of ASICO, are going to be there, hopefully, explaining why and how this shambles has come about this year. Um, and also explaining what's going to be going on in future and then taking questions from the from the fans. So uh, I'm going to go there with my microphone. I'm not going to record the whole thing, but when it's all finished, I'm going to see if I can get a few words with people. Larry Pasky, the uh, friend of the show and supporter, liaison officer at ASU Corps, agreed to speak to me and explain a little bit what's been said and what's what the plans are for the future. Um, but it was announced sort of last week, Rich, you, you posted this story that uh, Manuel Oroca was on his way out and it was poo-pooed by Larry at the time and, and maybe the maybe the actual story the headline in the story about someone already being selected to come in uh, yeah. is not necessarily that, accurate that was the that was the part that was poo-pooed he didn't say anything about Rocco going did he yeah well I, I was expecting waiting for you to poo-poo his poo-poo <laughs> in best Blackadder style yes. um but then, it, but then we played away at Coops on Friday, lost two one, and now Mamo Rocker has gone. So, um, and I, I shared the, the the story with you last night that he's he's now left. Um, that uh, Brian Page, who has been first team coach and academy coach, uh, he, and is now going to take over a caretaker to the end of the season, along with Tony Lettinen. Um, who is also coaching in the in the academy and is you know a former ASCII core player and a bit of a, a sort of ASCII core fan favourite in his day. Um, so yeah, it's it's I think it's a, I mean, yeah once one more time it's four four managers essentially in one season. That's, that's, that's a shambles, and I, I don't think it's all down to the players. And it and it, it, it there's something else, or I, not there's something else going on in some big conspiracy way. But but somebody hasn't been doing their job properly to allow for there to be four managers in one season. So I think I mean uh, there was there was a fair decent fairly decent crowd that I didn't want to side with when Sixton Borstrom came in that said that he wasn't good enough. And that uh, the, the wins that he got at Hoyiko were like on the back of a good squad. Basically, anybody could have won with that the Hoyiko side that he won the championship with. Uh, and it sort of turned out to be a little bit sort of, sort of true that, that Ostrom didn't really add a great deal. And if you look at his CV, he came from the States, but he didn't come from managing the States, he came from coaching the States. Roca, I didn't know a thing about when he turned up, but predominantly, if you look through his CV, his, the last club on his CV was, or the last achievement, was promotion from the Cypriot second division. And then before that, it was like the lower leagues in Greece. And you think, well, okay, he could be one of those guys that, you know, he's a young, he's only 40 or something like that, so he could be just a young coach making his way in the game, doing his, you know, earning his bread. But that's two appointments that you don't have a really great track record for in the back. Because I think one of the things is when you look at that squad of, of Asiko that you mentioned, you're right, you've got a pocket of, of pro really promising uh, young Finnish players like like Hataka and Nero, but also the Hredetskis are there, Lingas there, Malolo. Uh, and then you've also got like a, a relatively decent sized group of, of experienced players like Zanelli and Urme who came in. One, one thing I would say there uh, is that Zanelli, I, I thought, looked poor towards the start of the season. He came in under, I think, under uh, Bostrom and he looked poor and he looked a bit lazy. And under Rocker, He's really been working hard and fighting and looks a decent player. So I don't think we should think that Rocker has only done bad things. There have been some improvements to the team. Mm. Can I float something that is controversial, but I think would be good for Asiko? Mm. Mixu. <laughs> you said that in a message yesterday. I didn't know if it was if you were just drunk after being at the cricket all day, I, or well, that, that, that was part of that. But um, I, the <laughs> fact is, I you know the the club infrastructure physically is good. The the, the decision making process, the whole mm. the structure within about you know how the strategy, the the tone, the way that even just the ambition, you know what. What is Asiko trying to do this season? You know, at the start of the year, obviously they wanted to win the title, but you know they can't seem to 
sort of get around the fact that, you know, if you're in the lower, you know, mid table, you know, you need to play a different way. You need to get a different mindset. You need to play, you know, there's a reason why they're on 35 points and 20 behind Hoyko. It's, um, you know, but I think, you know, if, if and in the way that, you know, Simo had, you know, a long time there to set up, you know, almost a legacy as such, you know, he was there long enough to, to he was part of the furniture and he was a constant in that club. Um, you know, I mean, I, I know the name that Ari Burton suggested was Tommy Calton on the other day, which I, I'm not that impressed by. Um, but, you know, I'll be honest, Mick Supatalainen is back in Finland doing media work. <laughs> Asi could do a lot worse than hire him. Someone to get the fans excited and to and to a bit of profile to the to the club as well. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that obviously the Finland job went horribly wrong. But again, you know, there were so many different things going on that you know, obviously he was the manager and he goes down with the ship. But um, I, I think if he's at a club, you know, one of the bigger clubs in Finland, I, I think he could make. A big difference in getting them, you know. Yeah, he's not one for the future. Into he's not, he's not a young up and coming coach as such. But you know, he's a very knowledgeable guy. Yeah. And if given the right environment and the right sort of freedom, you know, and, and again, you know, you get in that culture, you have that mindset where he's managing a national team who are struggling. Part of it's his fault. But you know, if he goes to a club where he's expected to win more games, you know, will that? bring more out of him will he bring you know he spent so much time on the sort of UEFA and FIFA technical committees you know he spends the summers in the company of Alex Ferguson and you know some of the supposed brains of the the football world you know watching was it the technical advisor committee or something um you know he should there's a lot in there and you know I know it's easy to say but it's is he being wasted doing a bit of Premier League coverage on a Saturday although it's there's, easy money. Isn't it? There's this. A com <laughs> Jusper has made uh, some more comments. He actually made some comments earlier about Bagugi at Hoyiko. Um, but more recently, has just said that um, Balagari got fined for wanting signings. Then Bostrom came in with signings. Then Rocker came in with even more signings. It doesn't <laughs> seem like Raimo Sarayavi has any long term plans. And then um, ne next comment says, or the only long-term plan is getting matches for his son, Jesse Sabiarvi, which I think is a little bit is a little bit harsh. Um, but but I would I would say that the the long-term planning it has with the manager at least this year has to be questioned. Like um, Bostrom came in at short notice, and Rocker came in and was given the manager's job at short notice. I mean, is it is it necessary to to sort of just put someone straight in like that? Could is it would it not have been a good idea when Bostrom left to say to uh, to Brian, okay, take over as caretaker, mm. and this guy Rocker's coming in as first team coach, and just steady the ship now, and we'll look for a long term manager. It, it feels a little bit like these appointments have been rushed just to make sure the position is filled. Um, rather than planning for the for the future, and now you know there's what eight eight league games and one cup final to go. So let's hope that that Brian Page and Donny Lefton can just steady the ship, get through to the end of the season. We if we win the Swarman Cup final, we're in Europe again next year, which is kind of uh, an aim of the of the club is to get into Europe and to and to progress. We had three seasons in. In, in Europe where we've gone out in the first round. So we need to try and get into the second round and third round and try to progress like that. And I think it would be seen as a huge step backwards not to, not to qualify. Um, but this needs to be the time where a little bit of, okay, the manager's gone. Apparently they've been fighting or arguments among the players and between the, the manager and the, and the players. And that's what's ultimately led to this, this breakdown in communication and for him to leave. So let's get, get let, let's kind of regroup. Let's let's start fighting together on the same side rather than with one another. Let's start get out on the pitch and fight for the club and for the the fans, and then let's let's find someone who can be here for the long for the long term, whoever whoever that is. I, I don't know. 
whether that should be an internal appointment or or an external appointment with a low profile or an external appointment with a high profile. I don't have a strong feeling about that, but let's just pause and take a breath. Mm. And on that, maybe I should pause and take a breath. I think the only thing that I'd like to say is, well, Mitsu is a good choice. It's quite simple. There's one guy who is available who will fight everybody <laughs> and anybody, wherever. Big Shevki, he's, he's ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I, I you said that I, while I was taking a drink of water. You did that on purpose. That's crazy. I think, right? If you did say to Shefki, no family members and no aging Galacticos, right? Those are the rules. Take the job. And then he took the job. We finally get to see kind of like what he's like. Because I think really what, what he's done predominantly is try to build this same the same club in lots of different places. And I think if we if you do if you said to Shefki, like, okay, your experience and you have had some results and you have had some controversies as well you know if you if you don't basically blow the, the wage budget on old guys and if you don't bring in people you are either related to or know through your like social network then you can come and manage and i think he, i think he'd probably be doing it he'd probably do a better job than than what he's been doing in, at inter or at honka or pk35 right i tell you i tell you what i'm going to put those two suggestions to whoever i can speak to at the club later and see what they say uh, and hopefully, oh, when this when this live show ends, I'll add in some audio of what I've recorded later, and we'll see what they what they have to say. If, uh, if either of those things happen, though, Mixu or Shevki, then I think we do need a cut. Okay, <laughs> but this is Finnish football, so that it won't be very high. It won't be a very big cut. Yeah. It will be a big cut of something not very big in the. First... I'm thinking like a pint. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got one more. We got one more subject to discuss. Let's move on, uh, and. Uh, I don't need to talk too much about this, but um, Hukayat results, Mark. It's, it's taken a turn for the better recently. There's been three World Cup qualifiers and one friendly in the last few months. So how about if we talk about generally the, the, the performance in those, in those World Cup qualifiers? Uh, just, just so that for everyone listening, there were three games. One in June, which was uh, against Ukraine at, uh, at home and, and Finland lost 2-1. And then at the beginning of September, it was Finland versus Ireland, Ireland, Finland versus Iceland, mm -hmm. uh, which was 1-0 to Finland, uh, which is a, a cracking result. And then away to Kosovo, which was also 1-0 to Finland. So two solid results and, and six points in, in the matter of a few, game, uh, a few days. So um, what's, what's gone right? So, uh, the, so the first game in the summer was the friendly against Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein which was a, an encounter I'd rather forget altogether, except for the fact that Mehmet Haytemai scored uh, his first goal for, for Finland, which was a lovely header, which I thought was a, an amazing point like for both him and for us and for, for Finland. So that was a, a good game. In, in, yeah, uh, big up, big up to, to Mehu, friend of the show um, and, a, and an all-round good guy. So really pleased to see him get a goal. For the for the first team, and in that game we've got like a thread of how things have gone better. So so what happened in the game with Liechtenstein? We drew one one against a minnow, and really we slowed the pace down, and we started to play at their level. We started very well, but over time we basically started to play at their level. So we tried to we became more and more pub team like at the end. And when we conceded the equaliser, Freddie Jensen um, um, was kind of boxed in a little bit. He turned back into his own half and played a long diagonal back pass to Moisander. Um, that didn't make it. Uh, it the, the, the pass was intercepted, and uh, their guy, I think it was Hassler, picked a 20 yard shot into the bottom corner because he had a, just a, an acre of space and time in which to do so. But it wasn't Frederick Jensen's fault, really, for that goal. So, what happened was he was getting boxed in and chased around, and the players around him weren't giving him an option out. So, the only player who really did offer him like, a, a passing option was Moisander, the captain. And he, should, like, he basically called for the pass um, without scanning the situation. So he called for the pass quite early. And it was a bit, you, if, when you, if, you, if you watch the highlights again, you'll see that you'll see him first of all, like show and say, okay, I'm here. Uh, like, give me the ball. And then after he, after, after Jensen basically turned up and looked and saw him, he hit it. And then Moisander started to back away because he got a bit worried after a while that there was actually, you know, opponents in his, in his vicinity. And that's really what caused the... Um, caused the, the equalizer it was a it was fundamentally an individual an, an error and a bad call from Moisander. So we get to like a couple of days later against um Ukraine, we played really, really well, really, really like um 
it's very similar to how we played in, in, in the Iceland game, very similar to how we played in the Kosovo game. What happened was, uh, in that game, we made, again, a lot of really badly timed and almost inexplicable errors. So Timo Bukki, he picked up a back pass inside the box um, and skied it from, like, eight yards. And it's the kind of, like, it's very rare, but we all do it. We go, yeah, I could have put that away. But I'm relatively confident if I'd have picked it against an international keeper. I think if you pick the ball up eight yards from goal on the angle, with the keeper really unaware about what was about to happen, most players, regardless of position or, or level that you play in, could probably finish that shot. And he it, it just ah, lifted his head up and hit it into the stands, like you know, like like you can't believe. And by the same token, at the other end against Ukraine. Um, Moisander and Co switched off entirely after after Joel Pogenbalo had scored the equalizer. And so we conceded uh, the second goal about 60 seconds, roughly, uh, or something in thereabouts uh, to Ukraine. So the difference between that Ukraine game and then what we did against Iceland was, first of all, we put a lot of like emphasis on that on the midfield area and, and brought Alex Ring into the middle, who's been playing really well in the States. Um, but also, we didn't make stupid, inexplicable mistakes. And I don't know if it's like you know, fatigue or training or preparation or just the fact that that we didn't have the kind of experienced players who have been, uh, let's say, maybe under too much pressure for too long um, in there, like making bad calls. We just really had like, like if you look throughout the side, there wasn't really any baggage on the pitch against Iceland. Nobody had a specific point to prove. Everybody just had a kind of a job to do. And so I really think against, against Iceland in particular, the the way we played, the way we moved the ball, was just kind of as a quick. We didn't do that many things differently. And um, well, once Alex Ring got his, his wonder strike against... Uh, Sounds against like you're being heckled from South yeah, I am. I am. She's, not, she's not a fan of Alex Ring. It wasn't, <laughs> it was, I think she thinks it was better. <laughs> 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 no, no, but I think once Alex Ring got the goal, the, the task was a lot easier and there wasn't that many that many players who are who have been prone to mistakes. So, that's what I mean. Let, let me ask you, Mark, what, uh, because I, I didn't see the... Um, I didn't see the Iceland game. I saw the last quarter of it because Satu and I went on a, a tour of <laughs> Pokhyama in the car on uh, on Saturday and I, I didn't get back in time. But uh, Alex Ring scored on Saturday. Was he suspended from the game on Tuesday? No, he got a few knocks. So yeah. I, did, I did ask actually on Twitter. So, um, but no, he got, I wouldn't say an injury, but yeah, he wasn't in shape to play. He wasn't even named on the bench. So. What, what about Hetemar? He Because he, he was getting some positive praise on, on the Iceland game. Did he not want to play against Kosovo? Yes. Um, it was the same as last time. Yeah, but basically what happened is that obviously he was one of the players who eligible to have switched nationality, as it were. Um, and I think, you know, and it was something that came up when I interviewed him a couple of years ago that, you know, while it's something that you know, he feels in, in a lot of way that he's Kosovan. Um, you know, he's he's a Finland player and everything else, and he's you know he he didn't want to be in that position where you know and, and no one holds any grudge against him for it. I mean, it's you know it's one of those one of those things, isn't it? But um, yeah, I mean, he, he he was fantastic against Iceland last week. But uh, you know, it, it was everyone knew at the start that he was only going to be in the squad for the Iceland game, so it wasn't a shock. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I. I. When I saw that he wasn't there, I, when I saw the teams for the chip for the um, Kosovo game, I saw that Ring and Hetemai were both missing, which surprised me. And then I, I assumed it was something like, like you just yeah. explained there. Yeah, but I think fantastic might not be enough because I think there's been a couple of articles about that. So it was like the best, the best performance by a Finland player probably in the last decade, and. While that sounds like a really big statement, it's not. It's not. It's not there's not a great deal of competitors in that category. And I do, and I do think Hayden I was was fantastic. He was all over the pitch uh, in a good way against Iceland. He took the ball forward. Uh, he protected protected the, uh, the ball and his teammates. He gave everybody time. He never didn't miss a pass. Um, uh, so, and 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 then on the Tuesday game against Kosovo, um, what was? 
what was different or or did they build on that performance with with just a different formation or different lineup uh so they, they made six changes was it six i think uh yeah six 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 changes from the from the um iceland game um and it was a, it was a strange one i think because a lot of uh kosovo played amazing against croatia so at the same same or the, rather on the sunday uh they played uh, against croatia and they, it was only one nil and it was like a set piece goal as well from a, from an absolute beauty of a modric cross that uh, croatia got the win and i think it, me and there's a, a couple of others were just sort of expecting that, that kosovo would be really priming themselves up for the kind of the first competitive win of their of their um of their history i guess um and they were making all the right noises the the coach had come out and said he was going to retire after the after the campaign or not retire but resign from the national team because he wanted the the team to develop further um the performances leading up were quite good all of the like the captain and all the press interviews were saying that okay, finland are a team we can definitely go and get particularly if they've got injuries so i was quite everybody was quite apprehensive um from the finland side the five changes resulted in a rough 4-4-2 jensen tends to kind of pick up a place uh, off book up top um but it, it really quickly became apparent that, that they were gassed that they were that they didn't have kosovo didn't have anything in the tank so after about 10 15 minutes or so um they started to hump long balls and i mean tim sparv and thomas lamb in the middle of the pitch did really well to start to, to break up play through the middle to kind of force them into, into long passes and crosses but i don't know i think I think if we look back at the Kosovo game, we didn't really play that well. We could have taken, or could have maybe should have taken a, a, like a bigger win and, and imposed ourselves more on the game. Because against Iceland, the game was to frustrate them and to break them down and, and to, to slow their game down. But against Kosovo, we could have sped up the pace of the play and we could have put them under more pressure, um, like a lot earlier on. In the Kosovo game, I will say though that Alvin Grandland was, was great. Like he came on for I think his first full like. Uh, at right back, and he looked really good. And going particularly going forward, he, he offered a lot of nice, incisive through balls and offered an option out, out wide. I thought there was um, a lot of good play up front, a lot of kind of one and two touch football to to make opportunities cutting through the the Kosovo defence. It was, uh, I, I, can I say this? It was a pleasure to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think so. I think that's why we. Sh I mean, we sh that's why we should have won more because I think there was a, there was. A, a lot of times when we imposed ourselves on them, they couldn't get anywhere near the ball. But we didn't really, for some reason, in both the, both the Iceland game and in the Kosovo game, we don't like to shoot in the box. <laughs> we get the ball in the box, and then we take a touch and lay it off and lay it off and drop it off to somebody outside the box who tries to hammer it, and generally it goes sort of straight at the keeper. But I mean, we were really like we were really positive, and it was nice. It was just nice to watch a game and think, yeah. We'll, we'll be all right. We got it when we got to eighty minutes, and you can see it's starting to get scrappy. The yellow cards were coming out. Some of the tackles were getting a bit rough. Uh, Jensen got, got uh, he got dragged down. I think start of the second half with a, with a pretty dirty tackle from behind. He, he needed to be replaced. And when Scrab came on, Scrab was uh, also quite uh, quite nice and quick going forward. I mean, he drew a lot of I don't know good attention and bad attention from the defenders. He drew uh, a lot of attention from the press with his uh, signal to the referee from the side. <laughs> that was incredibly unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was, for those that don't, for those that didn't see it, uh, he was he had his arm in the air, waving to the ref to come on at the same time that he was I don't know wiping sweat from under his nose, and it looked like he was making some kind of Nazi gesture. But I think most people shared it in uh, in good humour rather than uh, rather than any serious complaint. Yeah, and then Puki got his goal from all the two yards, which was uh, it, for me it's quite strange because he, he did really well. He, he took he, for the for very few very few times in the match did he actually go and take on his opponents, mm -hmm. and he burnt past two defenders to get to the byline to put in the cross for Hammerlinen. Um, and he, he should do that more. He needs to do that more because he he caused them. Well, as soon as he ran at them, they had no idea. Like they really had a difficult time trying to contain him. Yeah, he did. Yeah. You're right. He did score from like two yards, but it was the work he did before in in making the opportunity and then following up that was that was really nice, nice to see and and deserved for him as well. Yeah. yeah okay. And I think I think after it though, I think we've got some nice questions for um for kind of around the rest of them because I think 
you know, Mo if you look at the, if you look, Moisander missed out. He was injured for, the, for both these games. When he gets fit again, I don't think he gets back in the team. Because, I mean, he's 30 and he's a brilliant player, fabulous professional, lots of experience. But, I mean, if you look at Arayuri and Bison in the centre, centre backs, he was mainly centre back after Oyala got injured in the Iceland game and he did the full 90 minutes as a, as a pair for the Kosovo game. And I thought they both looked really good. He's not going to take out Yerit Yeri Urunen, who's on the left back. So I'm not sure Moisander comes back and wins the team. And I'm not sure. You know, I think I think even Aero Markkanen did really well. Like, got some stick for missing for fluffing his chance against Iceland. He had a couple of chances that he could have done better with, but he led the line quite well. And he brought he brought other midfielders into the game. So one of the reasons the midfield was so strong was that Markkanen was able to bring him in. And you could see that was missing against Kosovo. He tends to sort of take the ball and turn. And run forward, and rather than bring in the players that are, are, are in around them. Okay, I think that we might need to wrap it up there. We have been just over an hour. We've managed to get through a hell of a lot. So, and we've kept it nice and tight. Maybe there's something for us to learn in the future mm -hmm. after 16 episodes. Maybe we we <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on that clock and trying to not not let it go too long. And I think we've done quite well. So, let me. Let me just remind everyone of our three websites. So there's fcswami.com. Uh, Mark, your most recent article was uh, naturally a, a report from the, the Kosovo game and obviously the Iceland games uh, a week or so ago. Um, Rich, you, your last post was... Uh, was uh, back in June, actually, about hookah you had need near transfer. And that uh, was written by Mark as well. Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> But, but you've got something else going on. Why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about what you're doing this afternoon? Um, yeah, it's a very, just a big change of pace. Just um, slowly starting a podcast about 80s movies, um, leaning heavily on the popular Smirsh pod, which is about Bond films. Um, it's a very, very loosely affiliated spin-off of that. Um, today, we say myself and Rich Johnson from the Football Attic are, We've watched Whiffnell and I, and we're going to be talking about that, which is, uh, you know, very an interesting sort. But um, now we've got some big guests lined up. Got um, James Richardson from uh, what is the now Turkey Football Show, Christian O'Connell's coming are. on. So um, yeah, so um, yeah, no, it's it's good. It's uh, it's taken a long time to get to this stage. Where today is actually the first episode we're recording. But uh, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. and um, yeah, no. So from um, they they'll. I'm not going to put those on until next month, but uh, they'll they'll be coming every sort of every week ish. But um, yeah, it's uh, I say in, in the run up to Child Two, it's um, you know because I I don't I have too much time on my hands anyway. So it's, yeah, well, um, <laughs> clearly, clearly clearly not if you're making babies every couple of years that keeps you busy enough. Congratulations on that uh, again. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I've timed it better. So we're doing it in the uh, in the winter, so I won't be missing any of the vacation league season. <laughs> or, or maybe it's better to do it during the football season. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, good, good luck with the um, with the podcast. Uh, you know, this is this has been a, a grounding for you. Now you have to do the technical stuff as well. So maybe I'll start picking your brains for for tips. Blimey. <laughs> um, I'm uh, my my explorefinlandpodcast dot com website. Um, still not really many podcasts on there, but been been a bit busy uh blogging lately a few i did a photo blog last weekend just took a took a road trip uh through pokemon and, and visited a few different places and satu and i are getting out and exploring so i i think we might do a bit more of that before winter arrives so keep your eyes keep your eyes peeled there and uh, i think i mentioned last time this visit saniyoki.fi slash en i'm doing a monthly blog there for uh, visit saniyoki as well about my my take on certain aspects of Finnish life. So if you are interested remotely in what I have to say or what I think, then check me out there. Um, subscribe to this show on the YouTube channel. You can search for me, Mark Wiltshire, or search for the Finnish Football Show, or search for Finnish Football Show on whatever podcast player you use. It will it should be on all of those. Um, I'll try and get this edited in the not too distant future once I've got out of this. Um, Fans forum with Ash Ecor today and, and know exactly what I've got to put out there. So uh, anything else from you, Mark? Nah. Okay. No, thanks good. for joining us. Nice to see you. See you again.
And to you, Rich, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. See you later, the next, boys. The next Hookayad games are in early October, so maybe we should get together just after that and discuss those and Swarman Cup and the how, how the Bakehouse League is looking for the uh, end of the year. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. All right, good stuff. Well, with that, let's listen to the theme tune and uh, we'll speak again soon. Thanks for joining us on the Finnish Football Show.